Amen. All right, well, we're there in 1 John chapter 5. And like I said in the announcements this morning, I want to deal with this subject of uh, the Trinity. And uh, we brought the whiteboard up here this, uh, this morning because I want to make, I want to show a few things and write a few things on here. And uh, I'll do my best to make it big so everybody can see it. And if you can't see it, then uh, you should have should have sat in the front row, I guess. I don't know. But um, because of the events in the last week or so, uh, there's been a lot, of, a lot of confusion and controversy about the doctrine of the Trinity. Many people have many questions. And uh, I want to teach today and preach uh, what our church believes about the Trinity. And uh, let me just go ahead and say this. What I'm going to teach you this morning is what my father, what my dad, who's sitting here in the service today, uh, taught me as a young boy about the Trinity. I remember being 10 or 11 years old, and we went to a church that had Sunday school, and my dad actually taught the Sunday school class for the, for the elementary age boys that I was in. And I remember my dad going to John chapter 1 and explaining to us and teaching us the concept of the Trinity. What I'm going to teach you this morning is what I believe. It's what I've always believed. Um, it's what I still believe. And it's what I've taught here at Verity Baptist Church since its inception. And what I'm going to basically do is attempt to not only teach you what we believe about the Trinity, but I also want to try to answer um, all sorts of questions that have either been asked of me, asked of my wife, or just that I've heard people talk about that there seems to be a lot of confusion about. Usually when I preach, I'll give you like three to four points, and I'll make several statements for each point, and I'll give you verses to back those points up. This sermon is going to be a little different. Instead of giving you points, what I'm going to do is I'm going to make a series of statements. And within those statements, I'm not only going to explain what we believe about the Trinity, but also attempt to answer a lot of the questions. If you still have questions after the service, please come talk to me. Uh, come talk to my wife, you know, whatever, you ladies, if you feel more comfortable with that. And, uh, and I, I want to try to be as clear and make sure that people understand. But I'm going to give you 20 statements uh, this morning about the Trinity. It's not 20 points, all right? We're not even going to go to a reference for all those statements. I'll, we might go to a reference, and I might make several statements from that uh, reference in Scripture. But the first place we're going to start is in 1 John chapter 5, and uh, of course, verse 7. This is probably the, the key verse for the doctrine of the Trinity. It says, For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. And what I did was I actually wrote the verse here. I'm going to sh write a lot of stuff in this, in this board and erase stuff or whatever, but I want to keep this verse up because I want you to understand this is kind of the key verse of the Trinity. And I, I want you to notice several things about uh, this verse. The, the first thing is that we usually key in on, and I don't think it's wrong to do, um, this phrase right here. These three are one. Uh, but I, also, I, I want you to notice that as much as the verse says three are one. It also says there are three. And I want you to notice the word are is a state of being. It's telling us that they are, that it, that it is one at the same time. And before I go any further, let me go ahead and say this. The word Trinity, sometimes we get attacked and people will say, um, you know, the word Trinity is not found in, in Scripture. And that's, and that's true. I don't have an issue with that. But I want you to understand that I do believe the word Trinity is a, is a, is a word that is appropriate to use. Uh, because what the word Trinity means is it basically is made up of, of two, two uh, words that are put together. And one is try and one is unity. Okay, this word is derived from this phrase right here. Three are one. You have three and you have one. Unity, you know, in Spanish, the Spanish word for one is uno, that's what unity means. So I want you to understand, when we're talking about Trinity, we're talking about three are one. I'll use the word Trinity, I don't have an issue with the word Trinity, and, um, you know, I just want you to understand that's kind of what we're talking about. Now, you, you don't have to keep your place there in 1 John 5, 7, because I'm going to keep the verse up here for all of us to reference to, but go with me to the book of John, go to John chapter number 8, in the New Testament we got Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and while you turn there, let me make the first of, of several statements. Number one, here's statement number one, and I would encourage you to write this down, or, you know, obviously this will be recorded, and uh, you can go back and listen to it if you have a question. Let me say this, I'm teaching you what we believe here at Verity Baptist Church, what we've always believed at Verity Baptist Church, what we will always believe at Verity Baptist Church, and 
I'm, I'm not doing this to attack anybody or to try to teach other people uh, in other churches. You know, obviously we live stream our services. Obviously we put our sermons up on the internet for the world and we're fine with that. But I want you to understand that this is for, this is what we believe here at Verity Baptist Church. And, you know, I'm not going to turn off the live stream or not post a sermon because then I'll get all sorts of false accusations, right? Uh, well, he's preaching oneness or whatever. But here's statement number one. The Bible teaches the doctrine of the Trinity, which is the belief, and I want you to understand this, the doctrine of the Trinity is the belief in three distinct persons that are one God. Three distinct persons that are one God. I like to use the word persons. I don't think the word person is a bad word to use, but whatever word you want to use, whether you want to call them three entities, whether you want to call them three individuals, the, the, the teaching of the Trinity is that there are three that are one. That's what we mean by the Trinity. That's what our church believes. That's what our church has always believed. Here's statement number two. There is, however, in my humble opinion, a spectrum in regards to how you explain or even understand the doctrine of the Trinity. What I mean by spectrum, I mean there's a broad range uh, in which, um, you know, you could understand the Trinity, explain the Trinity. Uh, you know, there's wiggle room within the ex explanation of the Trinity. And in that spectrum, I believe different people lie on different parts of that spectrum. But I, what I want you to understand is this, and here's, here's statement number three. We at Verity Baptist Church reject the teaching of oneness or modalism and what we mean by that what we mean by that you say what do you mean by rejecting oneness or modalism here's what i what i mean by that we reject the idea that god is one person who plays three different roles or three different parts or whose distinction, who's one person, but his sole distinction is between deity and humanity, you know, which is what the oneness crowd, they call, they say the deity of Christ is the father in him, and the humanity of Christ is the son. We reject that, and here's what I want you to understand, you know. They basically teach that the Godhead is one person, who reveals himself, identifies himself, or plays the role of three different, three different roles, but one person. That's not what we believe. That's not what we've ever believed. We believe the Godhead is three persons. And if I had time, I would try to draw better persons, all right? We believe they are three distinct, separate persons, but here's what we believe, here's what I've always believed, what I've always taught, is that at the same time, they are one. They are one person. They are one entity. They are one God. You say, you believe in oneness? No, no, no. I believe there are three individual entities that at the same time are one entity. Here's statement number four. Some people in the spectrum of the Trinity lean more, because you've got to understand, there's, there's two parts to this idea of the Trinity. There's three and there's one. The Trinity teaches three are one. Within the spectrum of the Trinity, some people lean more towards the three and less towards the one. Others people lean more towards the one and less towards the three. But as long as you believe, and here's what I want you to understand, and if you don't get anything else from the sermon, I just want you to understand this. As long as you believe that there are three individuals that are one God, you are in the Trinity camp. You believe in the Trinity. Now, you may fall on a different part of the spectrum. You may un understand it differently than I do, explain it differently than I do, but if you believe there are three Separate individuals that are one God, you're in the Trinity camp. As soon as you believe there's not three, but there's only one person who reveals himself differently, who puts on different hats, puts, plays different parts, has different roles, 
Or if you would say, well, there's one, but the only distinction is that part of him is God, and part of him is man, and part of him is spirit. As soon as you deny that there are three, you're no longer in the Trinity camp. You're in the oneness camp. Now, please understand something. Within the oneness camp, there's a spectrum. Within the oneness camp, you can have people that are the closest to us as possible within the oneness camp, and they might point at tongue speaking, you know, repent of your sins. You got to get baptized to be saved Pentecostals and say, oh, no, we're different. But here's what you need to understand. You may be on a different part of that spectrum, but as soon as you deny that there are three individual separate entities that are one God, you're no longer in this camp. You are in this camp. Number five. Just because you may explain the Trinity differently or use different terms, or even fall on a different side of the spectrum, does not make you my enemy, and does not mean that you're not within the camp of the Trinity. You are in the camp of the Trinity if you believe that there are three that are one. For there are three that bear record in heaven. The Father the Word, and the Holy Ghost. We know from John chapter 1 that the Word is the Lord Jesus Christ. And these three are one. I want you to understand this. Number six. The Bible makes very clear distinctions between the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Are you there in John chapter 8? Look down at verse number 13. Let's, let's see this in Scripture. The Bible makes very clear distinctions between the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Are you there in John 8? Look at verse 13. The Pharisees therefore said unto him, Thou bearest record of, notice this word, thyself. Thou bearest record of thyself. Thy record is not true. Jesus answered and said unto them, Though I bear record of myself, he says, I bear record of myself, yet my record is true. For I know whence, that means from what place I came, and whither, that means to what place I go. But ye cannot tell whence I come and whither I go. Notice verse 15. Ye judge after the flesh, I judge no man. And if I judge, my judgment is true. Now notice what he says. For I am not alone. Now could this guy say, for I am not alone? That would be a, a, an inaccurate statement. This guy is alone. There's one person. But when the son says, for I am not alone, that's an accurate statement. I notice what he says. For I am not alone, but I am the Father that sent me. It is also written in your law that the testimony of two men is true. Now, here he's using the idea, and what he's basically saying, we are two different men. And we're not saying that God is, is a human, but you know, throughout the Bible... God is called a man. You know, the Bible says that God is a man of war. He's just talking about a person, an individual. He says, it is also written in your law that the testimony of two men is true. Notice what he says. I am one. I am one what? I am one of those men that has a testimony that bear witness of myself. And the father that sent me, he's saying, that's the other man. That's the other person. That's the other witness. And in here, he's not, say, he's not bringing up the Spirit, but here's what he's saying. There are two of us. There's a distinction between us, and the Father that sent me beareth witness of me. And I don't want to beat a dead horse, because I don't, a lot of you have heard a lot of preaching on this lately, and, I, and we've heard a lot of passages. I'm not going to do that. I just want to show you that the Bible makes a very clear distinction between the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Another place we see that is in, is in the baptism of Christ. Let's go to Matthew chapter number 3. Matthew chapter 3. Look at verse number 16. You're there in John. You're going to go backwards past Luke, Mark, Matthew. Matthew chapter 3, and look at verse number 16. Matthew chapter 3, and look at verse 16. Matthew 3, 16, the Bible says this. Matthew chapter 3 and verse 16. And Jesus, all right, that's the son. And Jesus, when he was baptized, went up straightway out of the water, and lo, the heavens were opened unto him, and he saw, now notice, what did he see? He saw the Spirit of God, 
Okay, that's the Holy Spirit descending like a dove. Now, it doesn't say that he came in the shape of a dove. It doesn't say that it was a dove. He just said he descended, the Holy Spirit of God descended in the same way that a dove would defend, de descend. All right? So you have Jesus physically sitting there being baptized, and at the same time, you've got the Spirit of God physically coming down, descending. He saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and lighted upon him. Look at verse 17. And lo, a voice from heaven. All right? A voice from heaven. Who is that? That's the Father. Saying, this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. Now look, we don't believe that Jesus is like a ventriloquist, all right? He's not like throwing his voice, you know, like, lo, you know, behold. You know, what's he saying in here? This is my beloved Son. Okay, he's not doing that. There's actually a person in heaven called the Heavenly Father who's literally physically speaking about his son, all right? So here's what I'm just saying. The Bible makes very clear distinctions between the three persons, entities, um, individuals, whatever you want to call them, of the Godhead, all right? Now, here's what I would never call the Holy Spirit is a force, all right? You watch too much Star Wars if you think he's a force. All right, that's Hinduism. The Bible calls him a person. He's an individual. There are three persons. There are three individuals. There are three entities that are one. Statement number seven. Go with me to the book of Galatians, Galatians chapter one. You're there in Matthew. Go past Mark, Luke, John, Acts, Romans, 1st, 2nd Corinthians into the book of Galatians. Here's statement number seven. Not only does the Bible make very clear distinctions between the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Now listen to what I'm about to say. And just don't, don't write me off and just, oh wow, I can't believe you say that. Listen to the entire sermon and then make your decision, all right? Not only does the Bible make very clear distinctions between the, the, the three, the Bible also blurs the line between the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. The Bible makes very clear, at times, the Bible makes very clear distinctions between the three, but at times, the Bible also blurs the line and almost makes it seem like three are one. You say, what are you talking about? Are you there in Galatians 1? Look at verse 1. Let me give you some examples of this. I want you to listen very carefully. I'm giving you examples of how the Bible blurs the line between the three. Now, just because I'm showing you that doesn't mean that I don't believe there are three individual separate persons. All right? I already showed you verses to show you that. Now I'm showing you verses that the oneness crowd likes to use to say they're one, but here's what I understand. In the Bible, you'll find that God, the, the Word of God will often blur the line between the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Let me give you one example, the example of the resurrection. You're there in Galatians 1, look at verse 1. Notice what the Apostle Paul said, Galatians 1.1. 1, 1. Paul, an apostle, not of men, neither by man, but by Jesus Christ, and, notice what he says, God the Father, who raised him, who's the him there, that's Jesus Christ, who raised him from the dead. All right, according to Galatians 1.1, 1, 1, who raised the Lord Jesus Christ from the dead? It was God the Father. I mean, I think that's pretty clear. He says, and God the Father, who raised him from the dead. You're there in Galatians 1. Go to the book of Romans. Go to Romans chapter number 8. You're just going to go backwards. You're going to go past 2nd and 1st Corinthians into the book of Romans. Romans chapter number 8. So in Galatians 1, we saw that it is God the Father that raised the Lord Jesus Christ from the grave. In Romans 8 and verse 11, the Bible says this. Romans chapter 8 and verse 11. It says, are you, I'll wait for you to get there because I want you to see it. I could just read it, but I want you to see it. Romans 8, 11. But if the spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by his spirit that dwelleth in you. Now, the spirit, you see the capital S there? That's talking about the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit, the Holy Ghost. So according to Romans 8.11, who raised Jesus from the grave? It says, but if the Spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead. According to Romans 8 and verse 11, who raised Jesus from the dead? The Spirit. But wait, according to Galatians 1, who raised Jesus from the dead? The Father. Okay, let's go to John chapter 2. John chapter 2. 
Look at verse 19, John chapter 2. And when you get to John, do me a favor, put a ribbon or a bookmark or something there because we're going to leave John and we're going to come back to it. John chapter 2, look at verse number 19. This is Jesus speaking. John chapter 2, look at verse 19. John 2, 19. Jesus answered and said unto them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up again. According to that statement, who is going to raise the temple that's going to be destroyed in three days? He said, I will raise it up again. Then said the Jews, 46 years was this temple in building, and wilt thou rear it up in three days? He's talking about the physical temple, and he did reference the fact that the physical temple was going to be destroyed. But in this instance, he's talking about, look at verse 21, but he, Jesus, spake of the temple of his body. Okay, so according to Jesus, who raised Jesus from the dead? According to John chapter 2. Jesus raised himself up. According to Romans 8, 11, who raised Jesus from the dead? The Spirit raised him up. According to Galatians 1, who raised Jesus from the dead? God the Father raised him up. You say, well, how could that be? Here's how it is, because three are one. And in the Bible, you'll often see that line blurred because the Godhead is three separate individuals that are at the same time one. Let me give you another example. You're there, um, go, go back to Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. And we could go to so many examples, but I'm, I'm not going to. Just like we can go to so many examples to show the distinction between the three, I'm not going to. I just want to show you enough to make the point. Romans chapter 8. Look at verse 9. Romans chapter 8, verse 9. Romans 8, 9. But ye are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if so be that the Spirit of God dwell in you. Okay, according to the Bible, who dwells in you? The Spirit of God, right? The Bible says we were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise until the day of redemption. So according to the Bible, the Spirit of God dwells in you. Now, if any man have not the Spirit of God, he is none of his. Look at verse 10. Now, verse 10 is right after verse 9. So don't tell me that the Apostle Paul is contradicting himself and doesn't know what he's talking about. Romans 8, 10, and if Christ be in you, now, hold on a second. You just said that the Spirit of God dwell in you. Now you're telling us that Christ be in you. In other places, the Bible says Christ in you, the hope of glory. Go to Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4. You're there in Romans. You're going to go past 1st and 2nd Corinthians, Galatians, and Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4. Look at verse 6. Ephesians chapter 4. And verse 6. Ephesians 4, 6. One God. One God. How many gods are there? There's one. We don't, we don't believe in polytheism. There's not a multiplicity of gods. One God and Father of all, who is above all and through all, and, notice these two words, in you all. Now hold, you say, well, who's in you? Well, according to Romans 8 and 9, it's the Spirit. According to Ephesians 1, it's the Spirit. Who's in you? According to Romans 8 10, it's Christ. According to Ephesians 4, 6, it's, fa it's the Father. You say, how can that be? Because there are three that are one. There are three that are one. And in Scripture, you'll see very clear lines of distinction where Jesus is saying, I don't bear witness of myself. There are two witnesses. I witness of myself and the Father's witness. He's saying, look, there are very clear distinctions between the two. And then in other scriptures, you'll find where the lines blurred. Go to John chapter number one. John chapter number one. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. John chapter number one. John chapter number 1, look at verse 1. John chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning, in the beginning, isn't it interesting that the, doesn't the Bible begin with the words in the beginning? In the beginning what? In the beginning God. In the beginning God. Now notice how John 1, 1 starts. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. Now, in order for the Word to be with God, in order for the Word to be with God, don't they have to be separate? Don't they have to be separate individuals? In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. And then he says this, the Word was God. Well, how can I be with someone and be someone? 
I have to think, people will like to say, well, in one instance the Word is the Father, in another instance is the Godhead, the Trinity, or they'll say in both instances is the Father, or they'll say in both instances is the Trinity. But here's the thing, that, you, that's not what it says. Here's what it says, in the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God, and the Word was God. And I personally reject the idea that when it says in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God. It's referring to the, you know, Here's the thing, it's either referring to the Father and then the Trinity, or it's referring to the Trinity, you know, it, you can't have it both ways. It's either the Father both times or it's not. It's either the Trinity both times or, or it's not. And I don't think it's the Trinity both times either, because when it says, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, if you say, well, that's just referring to the Godhead, that would include Jesus, because he is part of the Trinity. So it's obviously not Jesus when he says, with God. It's another member of the Godhead, but at the same time, he was that same member of the Godhead. Why? Because the Trinity teaches that there are three, there are three that are one. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. Go to John chapter number 10. John, John chapter number 10. Look at verse 30. Let's look at some statements where Jesus just kind of blurs the line himself. John chapter 10, verse 30. John 10, 30, notice what Jesus said. I and my Father are one. I and my Father are one. Are you teaching oneness? Look, if saying I and my Father are one is teaching oneness, then Jesus taught oneness. I didn't say anything. I just read what he said. I and my Father are one. You say, well, well do you, look, doesn't I and my Father are one kind of sound like these three are one? Just because you say they are one doesn't mean you're teaching oneness. It means you're teaching that there are three. He's teaching I and my father, two different individuals, two different distinct persons at the same time are one. I and my father are one. Notice verse 31. Then the Jews took up stones again to stone him. Jesus answered them, my, good, my many good works have I showed you for my father. For which of those works do you stone me? And the Jews answered him saying, for a good work we stone thee not, but for blasphemy. And because thou, thou being a man, notice, makest thyself God. Now look, when the Jews say God, who are they referring to? Because they don't believe that Jesus is God. They're saying, you're making yourself the Father. Go to John 14, look at verse 8. John 14, verse 8. Just flip a few pages over. John 14, verse 8. Philip saith unto him, Lord, show us the Father, and it sufficeth us. Jesus saith unto him, Have I been so long with you? And yet, hast thou not known me, Philip? He that hath seen me has seen the Father. And how sayest thou then, show us the Father? And here's all I'm trying to tell you. Jesus himself would blur the line. Because the Father is individual. No man has seen the Father at any time. We serve an invisible God. You know, people get all wound up. Well, he's the express image of his person. And it's like, you know, because it is one person. Wrong. You know, and then other people try to tell me, like, well, it's like, they're, it's like the Godhead is like three identical triplets. I don't know where you got that from. <laughs> it's like there's these triplets, and he looks like the other. No, 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 no. He's the express image of this person because there are three. One's invisible. One has a body, but they are. One is made flesh, but they are at the same time one. Number eight. I personally, now please, please don't misunderstand what I'm saying, Okay. You need to listen to every statement that I'm making because you could easily take any one statement out of context and say that I'm saying something that I'm not. I personally, I'm using the word personally there because I want you to understand this is what I think. I personally do not believe that the Trinity is three parts that make up, compile, or collectively make up one. Here's what I mean by that. I don't believe this. I don't believe that this is God, and the Godhead is made up of three parts that are the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost or Holy Spirit. I personally don't believe that the Godhead is three parts that compile, that come together to make up one God. I personally believe 
that the Trinity is three persons, or whatever you want to call it, three entities, three individuals, that are one person, or whatever you want to call it, one entity, one individual. Say, Pastor Vance, what do you believe? Here's what I believe. I don't believe the Father is a third of the Godhead. Here's what I believe. I believe this is the Father. He's the whole thing. Say, well, then what do you believe about the Son? Well, here's what I believe about the Son. He's the whole thing. Well, what do you believe about the Holy Spirit? Here's what I believe about the Holy Spirit. He's the whole thing. Here's what I believe about the Trinity. That there are three distinct individuals that are at the same time. They don't, it doesn't say they come together, they compile together, they make up one. It says they are. State of being, one. So when the Bible says, in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, I don't have any issue with that. I don't have a problem with that. Because there are three that are one. Now, here's, here's, please don't misunderstand what I'm saying. Here's statement number 10. If someone believes that the Trinity is three parts that make up the whole, they're still in the Trinity camp. They're just on a different side of the spectrum than I am. But that's okay, because as long as you believe there are three and there is one God, there are three and there is one God, you're in the Trinity camp. I'm just explaining to our church people and our church family where I stand. I don't, I don't necessarily agree with this. But if you believe that, I don't think you're a heretic. I'm not going to, you know, separate from you because you're still in the Trinity camp. But the moment you say there are not three, there's only one, you're no longer in the Trinity camp. Now you're in the oneness camp. For this reason, is I don't, I don't use a lot of the illustrations. And look, I'm not against people using illustrations. I understand why they would use illustrations to try to help people. If you listen to my sermons on the Trinity, you're not going to hear me use a lot of these illustrations because, to me, they don't make sense. Like the egg illustration. You know, people say, like, well, there's the shell, there's the white, and there's the yolk, and they all come together to make one egg. That works if you believe this. That doesn't really work if you believe this, because for the egg illustration to make sense the way I believe it, you know, I would have to be able to separate that shell from the rest of the egg, and within that shell would be the shell and the white and the yolk. And I would be able to separate the white from that egg, and within that white would be the shell and the white and the yolk. And I would be able to separate that yolk from the egg, and within that yolk would be the shell and the white and the yolk. And you say, well, you just described three eggs. Yeah, I know, three eggs that are one egg. Amen. That's what I believe. These three are one. I don't believe they come together to compile one. I don't believe they come together to make up one. Now, look, if you believe this, I'm not against you. We're on the same team. You're still in the Trinity camp. But there's a spectrum. Some people lean more towards the three. Some people lean more towards the one. But as long as you believe there are three that are one, you're in the Trinity camp. As soon as you say there's one that plays three parts, there's one that plays three roles, there's one that makes, there's different distinctions, the humanity, the deity, the spirit. As soon as you say there's one, you're no longer in the Trinity camp. You're in a different camp. You're in the oneness camp. Same thing with the water. People say, oh, the water. You got, you know, the liquid, and then it's ice, and then it's team, but they're all H2O. That's fine. But here's what I'm saying. The only way that that would work for me is if you said all of the water is liquid, and all of the water is ice, and all of the water is steam, all at the same time. Because I believe there are three that, there are three, no doubt about it. There are three. Not oneness. There are three that are one. Number 11. We believe, go to John chapter 5. John chapter 5. We believe that there are three persons of the Godhead. We believe that the three persons of the Godhead are co-equal, are co-equal to each other. Here are the key words, equal equivalent. To each other. Are there in John 5.18? John 5.18, look at what it says. 
Therefore the Jews sought the more to kill him. Because he not only had broken the Sabbath, but said also that God was his father, making himself, notice this word, equal with God. Now when the Jews say God, who are they referring to? The father. They're going to kill him because he made himself equal with God. Go to Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2. You're there in John. You're going to go past John into Acts, Romans, 1st, 2nd Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians. Philippians chapter 2. Look at verse 5. Please don't misunderstand what I'm saying. Any of my brothers in Christ who believe this, they're not my enemy. I'm not fighting against them. I'm not preaching against them. I love them. I'm just explaining our church family where on the spectrum I lie. But anywhere on this spectrum or anywhere in between, you're in the Trinity camp. We're on the same team. We believe there are three. As long, here, here's the test. You say, how do I know if I believe the Trinity? Do, if you believe there are three that are one, if you believe there are three that are one God, then you're in the Trinity camp. As soon as you're not willing to say there are three, you're no longer in the Trinity camp. Philippians 2, look at verse 5. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be, notice this word, equal with God. Jesus did not think it robbery to be equal with God. We believe that the three persons of the Godhead are co-equal. They are equivalent to each other, which means they can substitute for each other, which is why sometimes it says that the Father resurrected Jesus from the grave. Sometimes it says the Son resurrected himself from the grave. Sometimes it says the Spirit resurrected Jesus from the grave. Why? Because they're equal. You can substitute them for each other, and there will still be a true statement. That's why sometimes it says the Father is in you. Sometimes it says the Son is in you. Sometimes it says the Holy Spirit is in you. Why? Because they're equal. And you can substitute them for each other and it still be a true statement. We believe that there are three that are one. Now let me say this. Go, 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 uh, go back to John chapter 5. Like I said, I'm making 20 statements. So you can't take any one statement on its own. All 20 of these statements is what we believe about the Trinity. All 20 of these statements is what we're answering these questions. I just got done saying that we believe that the three persons of the Godhead are co-equal to each other. With that said, here, are you there in John chapter 5? With that said, here's statement number 12. Even though the members of the Godhead are equal, there is a chain of command because there is a distinction. And here's the thing. I think we should leave them within the distinction that the, that the Bible tells us. Jesus is the Son. Jesus is the Savior. Jesus is the one who died on the cross for our sins. But you can go to Isaiah and find where it says, The Lord, Jehovah, is the Savior. You say, well, do you have a problem with that? I have a problem with that because these three are one. But I think we should leave them within the distinction. Obviously, there's the work that the Holy Spirit does within us. You know, yes, who, who's in you? I believe it's the Holy Spirit, but I also don't think it's wrong when the Bible says, well, it's the Father is in you or the Son is in you. Why? Because these three are one. And let me say this. Let me be very clear. Even though the members of the Godhead are equal, because they are separate, there is a chain of command. John chapter 5, look at verse 30. John chapter 5, verse 30. I can of mine own Self, do nothing. As I hear, I judge, and my judgment is just, because I seek not mine own will, but the will of the Father which hath sent me. Now look, we don't believe oneness. It's not that God has a personality disorder, and sometimes he's the Son, and sometimes he's the Father, and sometimes I want to do what the Son wants to do, and sometimes I want to do what the Father does, and it's not that within the Godhead, no, it's what the humanity wants to do. No, no, no. Here's what it says. He says, because I seek mine own will. And listen to me very careful. When people say, no, the Son is the humanity, they're, they're one step away from, or they've already taken that step and they're just not telling you, they don't believe in the deity of the Son. We believe the Son was, it. in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God. Amen. And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. So it's not, well, He became flesh and that was the humanity. No, the Word was God. Amen. So be very clear about that. So within the Godhead, they have different wills. But yet, Jesus always submitted himself to the will of the Father. 
he submitted himself even unto death. Why? Because within the Godhead, there is a chain of command. He said, I can of mine own self do nothing. As I hear, I judge, and my judgment is just, because I seek not mine own will, but the will of the Father which has sent me. You don't have to turn there. 1 Corinthians 11, 3 says, But I would have you to know that the head of every man is Christ, and the head of the woman is the man. He's talking about leadership. He says, Every man should have Christ as his leader. Every woman should have her husband, the man, as their leader. And then it says this, the head of Christ is God. Why? Because there is a chain of command. So even though we believe that they are equal to each other and that they can substitute for each other at times, we do believe that there is a chain of command. The Bible says that the Spirit does not speak of himself. The Bible says that the Son submits himself to the Father. Why? Because there is a chain of command. But at the same time, they're equal. You say, that's contradictory. We're, we're going to talk about that here in a second. But before we move on, let me, say, let, me, let me make several more statements. Here's statement number 13. Because the members of the Godhead are equal or equivalent to each other, and because they are often substituted for each other throughout the scriptures, like in the example of the resurrection or the indwelling, I, listen to me very carefully, and please listen to what I have to say and don't just judge me off or write me off. I don't think there's anything wrong with making the statement, Jesus is the Father. I don't think there's anything wrong with making the statement, Jesus is the Father. As long as what you mean by that is that there are two distinct persons or three distinct persons that are one person. Now, let me say this. Who remembers this from school? If A equals B, and B equals C, is this not a true statement that A equals C? Is that a true statement? I'm not, I'm not as intelligent, guys, so somebody who knows math. Is that true, yes or no? I think it is, right? I mean, if you're saying, you know, 2 plus 2 equals 3 plus 1, and you're saying 3 plus 1 equals 1 plus 3, then 3 plus 1 is 1 plus 3. Is that not true? Is that, I mean, that, that's a true statement, correct? Now, let me ask you something. If we believe that the Father is Jehovah, let me, let me redo this because I want to make sure I have room for you to understand what I'm saying. A equals B, B equals C, therefore A equals C. If we believe that the Father is Jehovah, who believes that? God the Father is Jehovah. Jehovah God is the Father. I mean, do we not believe that? I, I don't know. I'm, I'm confused now. Isn't that what the Bible teaches? Now, if we believe that Jehovah equals Jesus, do we not believe that? I mean, do we not believe that Jesus is Jehovah? Amen. Then I hate to break it to you, but the Father equals Jesus. Because of the fact that if A equals B and B equals C, then A equals C. Now, here's what I did not say. I did not say they're one person. I said they are three distinct individuals separate from each other that are, not that compile to make, not that come together to make, that are one at the same time. Now look, you may not like to say Jesus the Father, that's fine. You may not like that term, that's fine. But here's what I want you to understand, and here's why I don't think it's a big deal. Because if I said, or if somebody said, Jesus is the Father, right? Versus someone saying, Jesus is not the Father. You know what this sign right here means? If we were to put, if we were to have a word, you know, word, a, math, a mathematical word question, whenever the equal signs comes out, you know what you would say? You'd say is. This symbol means is. So when someone says Jesus is the Father, you know what they're saying? They're saying Jesus equals 
the Father. Didn't we, we just read that he thought not robbery to make himself equal with God? Therefore, the Jews sought the more to kill him because he not only had broken the Sabbath, but that also that God was his father, making himself equal with God. And when someone says Jesus is not the father, I don't like the term Jesus is not the father. You've never heard me say Jesus is not the father. You say, why? Because when someone says Jesus is not the father, you know what they're saying? They're saying Jesus equals not the father. You have a problem in scripture at that point. No, I'm not, you say, well, I like saying Jesus is the father. I don't like saying, here's the point that I'm trying to make. Because people will come to me, they'll send emails or text messages or whatever. Or they'll go on Facebook and they'll say, well, Pastor Jimenez said in a sermon that Jesus is the Father. Or they'll say, well, Pastor so-and-so in some sermon said that Jesus is the Father. Here's the point I'm trying to make. I don't think there's anything wrong with saying that. I don't have an issue with that. Yeah, are you going to go back on what you Back on anything, Jesus, there are three that are one. I don't think there's a problem with Jay. In fact, I have more of a problem with saying Jesus is not the Father than saying Jesus is the Father. Well, you said in an old sermon that Jesus is the Father. Yeah, because there are three that are one. Pastor so-and-so said in an old sermon that Jesus is the Father. That doesn't bother me. It doesn't bother me. You know why? Because I don't think there's anything wrong with saying that Jesus is the Father as long as what you mean by that, that there are three that are one. Statement number four. When the oneness crowd says Jesus is the Father, I'm not against what they said. I'm against what they mean. When the oneness crowd says Jesus the Father, if you're not going to listen to anything, just listen to this, please. When the oneness crowd says Jesus is the Father, I'm not against what they said. I'm against what they mean. Because what they mean by that is that the same God who's playing the role of the Father is also playing the role of the Son. I don't believe that. I've never believed. And they want to go around and say, Pastor Jimenez said Jesus the Father, therefore he agrees with us. No, no, no. See, when I say Jesus the Father, and when you say Jesus the Father, we mean two different things. You mean he's one person, and the same guy who plays the role of the Father is playing the role of the Son. I mean there are three distinct persons that at the same time are one. Say, so where did you get that from? Well, I think that's what the Bible says. These three are one. Are you denying that there are three? No, no, no. The same verse says there are three. Well, which one is it? It's both. It's three that are one. Number 15. I believe when people go too far in one direction or the other, when they go too far in the three direction or in the one direction, they're going to find it easy to understand and explain some verses and difficult to understand and explain other verses because there are some verses in the Bible that highlight the three and there are other verses in the Bible that highlight the one. Why? You say, is that a contradiction in Scripture? No, the Trinity is three are one. So if you go too far in one direction or too far in the other direction, you're going to have a problem with some verses. Now look, if you, you say, well, I don't think you should say Jesus the Father because I think there's three distinct persons. Well, we can disagree on that, but here's the thing. As long as you believe there are three that is one God, that are one God, we're, we're, in the same, we're on the same team. We're, we're both in the Trinity camp. As long as you believe there are three that are one. As soon as you say, no, no, there's one, only one, there's not three, you're no longer in the Trinity camp. You're in the oneness camp. So look, within the Trinity camp, here's all I'm trying to say. Someone could say Jesus is the Father and believe in the Trinity. And you say, prove it. Go listen to my Isaiah 9 sermon. I preached it in 2014 before any of this was a controversy, before any of this was a problem. And if you listen to the entire sermon, listen to the entire sermon's context and tell me that I'm preaching oneness because I'm not. The whole sermon's about me. The, 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 that part is proving the Trinity so when people say, well, Isaiah 9 says that he shall be called the everlasting father. I don't have an issue with that. Well, Colossians 2 says that in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. I don't have an issue with that. So why? Because I believe that there are three that are one. Now, if you start saying there are three that compile into one, then maybe you're going to have some issues with some of those verses. And that's okay. I'm not against you. As long as you're on my team, hey, we're all for it. I'm just telling you what I believe. And people, you know, people are like, well, Pastor Matthews is teaching oneness. No, no, no. Just because I said Jesus is the Father doesn't mean I'm teaching oneness. 
I believe, your statement number 16, good intentioned people go too far in one direction or too far in another direction in order to try to make logical sense by human standards of the doctrine of the Trinity. Your statement number 17, my position, my position may seem silly or contradictory to you, but let me just explain something to you. The Trinity is a silly and contradictory thought by human logic. Three R1 contradicts itself. By human logic, this is a silly statement. I mean, if I came to you and I said, there's three markers, but they're one marker. You say, that doesn't make any sense. I know. That's the Trinity. Your, 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 your position is a silly sta position. It's a contradictory statement because you say there are three and you say there are one. There are three. There are one. The, the Trinity is a contradictory and silly. That's why we have to take it by faith. But here's the point that I want you to understand. My position may be silly. My position may be contradictory by human logic. But my position is also not shaken by any verse that is thrown at it. And my position also does not require me to explain away any verses. Because when people come to me and they say, well, Jesus is called the Almighty, and the Father sitting on the throne is called the Almighty, what do you say about that? Amen. These three are one. Well, Jesus is called the Alpha and the Omega, and the guy on the throne is called the Alpha and Omega. What do you say about that? Amen. Amen. These three are one. Well, the Father is called the Father, and then there's a reference to him being the Father. These three are one. Well, Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father, because these three are one. Amen. And then the other crowd says, well, but then the, God, the Lamb goes and takes the book away from the one sitting on the Father. What do you think about that? Amen. There are three. That are one. That's what I believe. That's what I've always believed. Listen to my sermon on the Trinity in 2012. Listen to my sermon from Isaiah 9, from Isaiah 48. Listen to whatever sermon you want. I've never taught anything different than this. And I'm also not scared of the oneness doctrine. Because I've never taught the oneness doctrine. And I don't think saying Jesus the Father is teaching the oneness doctrine. When they say Jesus the Father, I'm not against what they're saying. I'm against what they're meaning or teaching. When they say, well, the Bible says that the Father, which is in heaven, and then Jesus said that he was, which is in heaven. What do you say about that? These three are one. That's my position. Go to 1 Timothy chapter 3. First Timothy chapter 3, we'll be done right now. We'll be done. I got a couple more statements. And then I'll make some concluding, a concluding message and we'll be finished up. Number 19. Understanding that there are three. Understanding that there are three is pretty easy. I would call that the milk of the word. Any new believer can read the book of John and see that there are three. I agree with that. Understanding that there are one or that there is one is pretty easy. I mean, a basic reading of Isaiah, any book of the Bible, will show you that there's one God. That's pretty easy to understand. That's a milk of the word. 1 Timothy 3.16 says this, And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, received up into glory. Here's the point that I want to make. Understanding that there are three is pretty easy. It's milk of the word. Understanding that there are one or is one is pretty easy. It's a milk of the word. But how we could comprehend that three are at the same time three individual, coexisting, co-equal persons with different wills, lying in a chain of command, how these three at the same time are one. You know what that is? That is a great mystery. So you haven't explained to me. I'm not trying to. I don't think I ever can. I don't think I ever will. Jesus will have to explain it to us in heaven. So when you get to heaven, are you going to see one on the throne? I'm going to see one on the throne and the son sitting on the right hand of the father. Like the Bible says. 
Well, is Jesus not the Father? No, there, there's two, but they're one. And if you have the Holy Spirit, there's three, but there's one. Deuteronomy 29, 29 says this, The secret things belong unto the Lord our God. But those things which are revealed belong unto us and to our children forever, that we may do all the words of this law. Why don't we just worry about the things that are revealed unto us and we can understand? And the secret things that we can't really grasp? Let's not go too far in one direction and too far in another direction to try to make logical sense of it. Let's just realize that the secret things belong unto the Lord our God. And it's a great mystery. You say, well, what's a mystery? Not that there are three. That's easy. Not that there is one. That's easy. Here's the great mystery, how three are one. That's a great mystery. Statement number 20. If you believe, I don't, wanna, I don't want this sermon to, to cause division within our movement. So let me be very clear. If you believe that there are three distinct persons, whatever you want to call them, three persons, three entities, three individuals, that are one God, we're on the same team. We're in the Trinity camp. Now, we may be on different parts of that spectrum. You might lean a little more towards the three, and I might lean a little more towards the one. But as long as you believe there are three separate, coexisting, co-equal, within a chain of command, individuals, persons, entities that are one God, even if you believe they make up one God, you're in the Trinity camp. And you're my brother. And I'm not mad at you. I don't hate you, and you're not my enemy. We might lie on a different, we might explain it different, we might use different illustrations or whatever, but we're in the Trinity camp. But as soon as, be very clear, as soon as you deny that there are three and you say, no, there's one that reveals himself as three, or there's one that plays three different roles, or there's one which distinction is his body versus his soul versus his spirit because there's only one, as soon as you say that, as soon as you say there's only one person, not three persons, one person who's revealed differently, who's, the distinction is his flesh versus his deity, then you're no longer in the Trinity camp. And I'd like to finish this morning, and I hope this answers some questions, and if it didn't, that's fine. And if you disagree with me, that's fine. As long as you believe there are three that are one, we're on the same team. But if you have any questions, come talk to me. I'd be happy to answer your questions. But I want to end the sermon this morning by, making a mess, by sending a message to Tyler Baker, Elliot Ray, Rick Martinez, and Russell Bobbs. And some of you I know very well. Others of you I, I think I've just met here and there. But here's the message I want to send to these guys. For those of you that have made a video up to this point, I want you to know I've watched all of your videos. I watched and I listened because I wanted to know what you believe from your own mouth. And I want you to understand something, that I did not watch the videos just angrily, just mad at you. I wanted to give you the benefit of the doubt. I wanted to see what you believed, and I wanted to see if there was any indication that we were just blowing things out of proportion. But here's what I want you to understand. I listened very closely to what you said, but I listened even closer to what you didn't say. Because you made a lot of great arguments, like the Bible does, that they are one. But there were certain things that you refused to say. And you want to go around and say, Pastor Jimenez believes the same thing we do. No, we don't. No, I don't. Well, he said Jesus the Father. Yeah, but when I say Jesus the Father and when you say Jesus the Father, we mean two different things. I listened to what you said, but I listened even closer to what you didn't say. And let me just be very clear. I believe Faithful Word Baptist Church and Pastor Steve Anderson was right to throw them all out of the church. Just spreading doctrine that goes against the church is enough to get you thrown out of church. But I do believe that they, be that they are in the oneness doctrine. They may be on the side of the spectrum closest to us, and they're trying to point out these radical Pentecostals and say, we're not the same. But as soon as you say there's one person, you're in their camp. I do believe that you are in the oneness camp, and I do consider you heretics, and here's why. Because you never said in your video... You never said, in fact, you start, some of you started to say and you stopped yourself. You never said there are three that are one. You never said there are three separate, coexisting, co-equal individuals that are one God. You believe there is one person. And, you, and, and the way you're making your videos, you're trying to be real slide, and the way you're explaining it, but I listened. I 
gave you the benefit of the doubt. I listened very closely, and I was more shocked by what you didn't say than what you did say. So don't go around saying, Pastor Jimenez teaches, no, no, no. You and I don't believe the same thing. And if you want to prove me wrong, make a video. Make a video where you say, I believe there are three separate, distinct individuals that are one. But that's not what you said. That's not what you believe. And simply saying, we all said Jesus is the Father. I think we've all said Jesus is the Father. No, nobody in our camp who says Jesus is the Father believes oneness. What we meant by that is that there are three that are one. They equal each other. If you believe there is only one person, one entity, one individual that is distinct only in roles or in ways in which God reveals himself, deity versus humanity, then you are not in the Trinity camp. You are in the oneness camp, and you believe a heresy. So even though you may say Jesus is the Father, and even though I may say, and I don't know that I'm planning on stopping saying Jesus is the Father, we don't mean the same thing. And we don't believe the same thing. And our church believes in the Trinity. And our church believes that there are three, there are three that are one at the same time. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord, for your word. Thank you for your Bible. Lord, help us not to bite and devour one another. For those of us that are in the Trinity camp, we may lie. We may lie on separate sides of the spectrum. But if we believe that there are three that are one God, then we're in the Trinity camp. And help us not, Lord, to try to, uh, to, try to set each other up, to try to uh, allow people to pin us against each other, to try to fight and, and, and say, well, you said this. And, Lord, when, when we do preach against heresy, help us to be clear. Their heresy is not because they said Jesus is the Father. Their heresy is because they, when they say that, what they mean by that is the same guy who's playing the role of Jesus is also playing the role of the Father. And that is heresy. Father, I just pray you'd help us to continue to do great things for you. Father, I pray you'd help us to not be divided with terms and illustrations, but to realize if we believe that there are three that are one, we believe in the Trinity. We love you, Lord. In your precious name I pray.